Hey guys, welcome back to another crypto market rundown. The US government seems to be selling some of its Bitcoin. You need to know about it, so we're gonna tell you. And Bitcoin is in quite a bit of a range bound here. So we bring Brendan to bring you the Bitcoin charts. Right, Brendan? Yeah, that's exactly right, TiVo. The crypto market has seen quite the pullback over the last couple of days, and it has everyone asking, is this a bear trap or is there more downside to come? So we take a look at the charts, we take a look at the news, everything that's happening, and then we talk about the current circumstance of not only Bitcoin, but the whole crypto market as well. And it's end of an era with SBF. He was sentenced. We have a little funny story with him and his final quote before he heads to prison. The timestamps are below so you can watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. Give us a like, subscribe, comment. Thanks for watching and enjoy the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to your weekly crypto market rundown, where we talk about everything that's happening in the great world of cryptocurrency, from the fundamentals in the news to the technicals on the chart. We spend the time doing hours of research so that you all don't have to. And we got a solid week. You know, we've had some solid price movements. There's a lot going on, some funny stuff, some entertaining stuff. But the market took a little bit of a dip. Isn't that right, t -Bell? That's correct. Um, it did seem like people were getting a little excited after that first dip that you called. And, you know, we thought we might look to test those all time highs, maybe go past it. Wasn't the case. Uh, and as we always say, you can never predict the future. You can just plan your best for it. So here we are trying to break it down and uh, kind of see where we're going next. Yeah. And this one kind of came as a surprise to not only myself, but I think most people, because what we saw here, and again, we're going to pull up the charts. We're going to be pulling up a lot of charts and a lot of different images, actually. So if you're one of the listeners on like Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Audible, make sure you tune over to the YouTube if you want to see all the different like images and videos that we're referencing on the screens. Um, but we're going to be diving into those charts in just a second. But before we do that, you know, like I said, this came as a surprise to a lot of people. I myself was expecting Bitcoin to maybe pull back to the high 60s. What I wasn't expecting is a breakdown to $64,000 and a lot of other people weren't as well because what we saw was over $400 million in liquidations. This means that over $400 in uh, leveraged positions was liquidated. And that's a lot of money. You know, in some of the previous pullbacks, we have seen some some bigger numbers uh, reaching around a billion. But I think what's even more ironic is that if we were to do a move, I was talking to a buddy about this, if we're going to do a move up to around 75,000, he was telling me that there would be a couple billion with a B in liquidations of shorts because people were getting really, I guess, content with shorting the market as it had broken out to its new all time high. And there's a lot of shorts stacked up until a new all time high, right around $75,000. Now, the previous all time high is right around 74, just under that, it's at high 73,000s. And so, what we have is we actually have a really nice potential here as Bitcoin dips to kind of collect a lot of buyers. And I think that's a good segue into everything that's happening on the charts over here. So, let's go ahead and examine what exactly has happened and if Bitcoin is still in danger. Because as we've kind of come down over here, we smashed right through the 20 day moving average and right through our previous ascending support line. Now, this is you know something that we've used for a long time now, going all the way back to around January is when this ascending support line started. And we can see that you know around the beginning of February, we bounced off once. And then in February, uh, we bounced off again twice. Then we came back in March. Now we're coming back in April. And this has been a, priv a pretty pivotal support zone for Bitcoin as it has been you know, climbing the price chart this year. Now, the other thing that we saw is that when Bitcoin broke down here below the 20-day moving average, I think the reason why this shocked a lot of people is because Bitcoin just came off a rally from this you know, ascending support, you know, broke above the 20 day moving average, and then it closed. It hooked on it for over a week. So, you know, this is an area that had previously been a support. We can see the, the massive bounce that Bitcoin saw the last time that it did this. It did a little um, essentially break hook, and people were expecting a go to happen next. And we got seven days of consolidation uh, above the 20 day moving average. And then we hit the resistance and saw this breakdown. 
Now, there's a lot of reasons, right? There's a lot of catalysts that we're going to be unpacking as to why this could have happened today. Um, some sources around the ETFs and selling there, other people looking at the traditional markets and potential rate cuts, um, other things saying that maybe the US government is selling off some seized Bitcoin. There's a lot of potential options that we have here. But regardless, the price of Bitcoin kind of saw off a really hard rejection from around $72,000 here, all the way down to around $64,000. And so what this means is that in about a three-day window, Bitcoin fell roughly 10% in price. Now, even with Bitcoin coming all the way down here, this is still, yet again, a higher swing low. And until we break this pattern and see a lower swing low, a lower low on Bitcoin's chart, I'm really not that concerned yet. Bitcoin still has not broken the 50-day moving average. We are nowhere near the 200 day moving average, which is still around the low 40,000s. And so until we break this uh, trend that we've been in, right, higher highs, higher lows, until we break that, I'm really not all that concerned. So if we go and we look at like Ethereum, for example, as well, Ethereum's in a little bit more of a bearish standpoint. And this is something that we've talked about in the crypto market uh, rundown in previous weeks is that, you know, from my view here personally on Bitcoin, the one thing that I've tried to make clear is that Bitcoin has been outperforming Ethereum here. Now, I'm a huge Ethereum fan. I own a lot of Ethereum. Heck, I might own more Ethereum than I do Bitcoin. You know, at this point, it's really close. I'm not a maxi, which is the point that I'm trying to make. But as someone who is an avid trader, as someone who loves trading the crypto markets, I look at the Bitcoin chart and I look at the Ethereum chart. And then I look at something like Ethereum compared to Bitcoin. And when we look at these, this is, again, something I referenced about a week or two ago, saying, hey, this is very clearly in a downtrend. Ethereum compared to Bitcoin is very clearly in a downtrend. So when a trader like myself comes in and is saying, hey, where is the most opportunity to the upside? Where is the least amount of risk, the most amount of reward? Where is the trend, my friend? And that goes back to Bitcoin outperforming Ethereum. So, you know, again, when I look at like what I want to be kind of longing and trading here, I love my altcoins. We're going to talk about a couple of verticals that are still grasping my attention. Um, but when it comes to like the big caps, I'm still more favored on trading Bitcoin. Now, again, today's one of those exceptions. Ethereum's up 2%. Bitcoin's up about one and a quarter percent. So today, Ethereum's outperforming Bitcoin. But if we zoom out on the bigger chart here for the past, you know, I don't know how long we can really, really zoom out. Bitcoin has been outperforming Ethereum for well over a year, and it has ramped up pretty much since the mid part of March. And that's where we see this little chart that we have circled uh, on the screen as well. So for the time being, I'm still kind of looking at like my short term positions for the big cap saying I'm going to be favoring Bitcoin a little bit more until this trend breaks. And as we zoom out, we can see that this is a pivotal level of support for Ethereum compared to Bitcoin. It has come down here since, you know, around the time of October last year. We can see that it came down here once and twice and three and four and five and six, now seven times and tested this level. Now, it's always bounced and it's always held. However, that makes me a little bit concerned that maybe this ETH BTC chart is wearing down the buyers who have tried to hold this level for so long now, almost being six months time. So that's one of the other things that I'm kind of watching out for but you know tivo was there anything that kind of shocked you about the the price movements and the different stuff that we saw this week because unlike maybe last week where we saw rwas and ai and you know solana ecosystem and other stuff you know actually performing green despite bitcoin falling this is a little bit different because you know bitcoin took a bigger hit this week and uh, pretty much everything was affected, right? We look at the the charts, my little watch list over to the right, and there's a lot more red than we saw previously. And we, we talked about this when we were making the sheet, but the, so I, I personally think this is kind of an opinion from watching, you know, the traditional markets alongside with the crypto markets and the rate cuts. So the suspected rate cuts at the beginning of the year were six, six rate cuts, and then it slowly has dwindled down to three. And while the market has digested that, the, the regular stock market and just plowed higher, I think that we need to be aware that, especially with ETFs um, being approved, and even before that, the Wall Street speculators were 
I believe more into Bitcoin than the last cycle is that I think you're going to have much more of a correlation um, to the regular markets uh, than maybe last cycle or in the future. Like we, we like to think, you know, Bitcoin is its own asset class um, in the long run and it might not correlate to the stock market all the time. But I think in this shorter window, we need to be more aware that, hey, we've had an amazing run um, of the last couple months. And so has the stock market. I mean, there are some crazy statistics I've been seeing about whether it was the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ and the Dow, just consecutive days up. It was like six weeks without more than a 1% down day. Um, it, it's been it's been a heck of a run for those. And so I think that as you kind of look at you know the inflation picture and the Fed coming into play and then the election coming into play, it's there's a there's a lot of um, you know outstanding things that could may may not happen that will affect the markets as a whole. And my personal opinion is that you, you kind of do need to lump the crypto markets and Bitcoin in with that as we look forward uh, to the rest of the year, even though you may not want to. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we saw this week is the traditional markets getting kind of wrecked. Um, NASDAQ, S&P, they've been struggling at the highs. And I know that yesterday and even a little bit today, they got slapped. They saw some some pretty nice red days and they've been bleeding out for a little bit off the highs and uh, just kind of slowing down. And so maybe that's just on risk sentiment here. And if you're not familiar with on risk sentiment or on risk investments, this is things like stocks, like cryptocurrencies, um, things that are a little bit more risky in nature. And so when we look at like on risk investments and on risk investors, uh, they tend to kind of move together kind of around this idea that you are alluding to TiVo of like the rate cuts and everything that's happening over on that front. I know you know, me and you were chatting about this yesterday, saying, you know, are these things factored in now? Originally, we were saying, hey, there could be six or seven of these this year. Um, now the Fed has pretty much said, no, it's going to be three, which they always said. But we and a lot of analysts were like speculating that they're saying three to be like uh, conservative, but it's more realistic that we get higher than that. But it's looking like they're doubling down and saying, no, we're not going to go higher than that. We are going to stay steady on three. And so now it's almost looking like uh, more rate cuts, like five, six, seven are almost out of the question for them now. And so maybe investors are looking at that and going, OK, well, you know, we thought that it could be a little bit more optimistic. It looks like that that could no longer be the case. And they're kind of shutting down that idea. And so maybe people are are slowing down a bit. The flip side on on from my opinion or from what I'm seeing is they're they're could there's people now coming on saying there's no rate cuts mm. and i don't think that it 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 kind of depends on the economy right so if the economy's strong and we're going into an earnings season here so you know the q quarter one was done the other day i think april 1st was the first day of q2 so now these earnings are going to come out for these companies and and you've had a disparity of like what you said to build on your point of risk on we had a reddit ipo and then five days after the reddit ipo it was up a hundred percent yeah. Um, not to get political in any facet, but there was this Donald Trump media that launched um, with um, Truth Social, whatever uh, oh, yeah. conglomerate of companies that has. So that went public and that shot up, you know, 50, 60 percent in three days. And now, like you said, when everything was getting wrecked, you know, your bigger companies, your NVIDIAs, your Facebooks, they're down a little bit. But these these high risk, high beta stocks are, are falling fast. Reddit, the uh, the Trump digital media stocks. The, a lot of things that were forward facing risk on assets um, are the ones taking the biggest hits. So l l the, I guess the, it's not the amount of rate cuts. I think that's super important. It's it's kind of the healthy economy. Like you want to make sure that inflation is under control right now. The consumer is extremely strong um, throughout, whether it's traveling, airplane tickets, all that. It's like you, you just want to make sure that the economy holds together. So it's not as important as like how many rate cuts we get as much as the entire picture of, of the U.S. economy. I agree. And I've I've also seen something else kind of floating and circulating around about this whole Silk Road Bitcoin drama. Have you seen this? Yes. Very interesting, to say the least. Well, it, it seems like they're, the whole community is split here, right? You have a bunch of people saying, hey, the U.S. government moved 30,000 Bitcoins. You have another group of people that are saying, no, you guys are idiots. You don't know how to read transactions. They've only moved... 2000 Bitcoin. And so it's a big deal because so to kind of break down the story for everyone who hasn't heard of it yet, um, there is a lot of news being published around this topic of 
you know, the government seized Bitcoin from the Silk Road, and now they have 30,000, just over 30,000 Bitcoin uh, in a wallet, and that they could be sending it to Coinbase. And if they did, that likely means that they're going to sell because, you know, the US government typically uses Coinbase as their like exchange partner. Um, and so if they're doing this, then that's roughly $2 billion worth of Bitcoin that could, in theory, be sold off onto the market. So the drama here comes in that some people are saying that they sent all 30,175 Bitcoin to Coinbase. Others are saying, no, there's no way they did that. Read the transactions. They've only sent $2,000 or no, roughly 2,000 Bitcoin, excuse me, over to Coinbase and that the transaction was misread because roughly 28,000 of the 30,000 Bitcoin still remain in the US government wallet. And so this is where people are starting to disagree, right? Because there was a BlockWorks report saying that they were going to sell roughly $130 million worth of Bitcoin, which just so conveniently comes out to roughly 2,000 Bitcoin. And what do you know? They move this over, and it's likely that the selling of this 2,000 Bitcoin has already happened. Um, and so that was like the whole BlockWorks report here. And in my opinion... If, if 30,000 Bitcoin are going to be sold, $2 billion worth of Bitcoin would be sold. I think James Safart, who actually replied to the thread that you have on the screen here, he was saying, hey, it's likely that if this happens, they would go to an OTC market. Why would they mass sell and crash the very price of the asset that they're selling when they could maybe get, <clears throat> well, number one, not in charge for any kind of like manipulation or, or you know insider trading or anything like that. They could just go to an OTC market, which stands for an over-the-counter market where price is not impacted or there's very minimal impact to do with this kind of stuff. They are ex essentially selling the Bitcoin and exchanging hands without going through the traditional market. It's like a private sale almost. So yeah, I mean, what a crazy situation. I've been reading and looking into this. You can see that there's someone, Alex Thorne, on the screen here who's just kind of taken the side of... These people don't know how to read transactions. And you can kind of see him explaining his thought process and how all 30,000 Bitcoin was not sent. And it was only 2,000. And so there are two sides to this war. And for good reason. Because if the U.S. government did send 30,000 Bitcoin to Coinbase with the intent of selling, then yeah, that's going to be pretty negative on price. We've seen what happens when Grayscale sells $2 billion worth of Bitcoin over the course of a week. It's not a great thing. But then there's the other side that are saying, hey, this not only wouldn't happen, but it's actually not happening at the moment. And it's likely that they'd go through one of these OTC desks and that they didn't actually send all the Bitcoin. They just sent a little test transaction over, sold a little bit here. It was announced that it was going to happen beforehand from Blockworks, yada, yada. So, I mean, man, what a chaotic situation. And people are speculating that this is the reason why crypto took a dip here. There was misunderstanding, miscommunication, maybe a little bit of a fud around this topic uh, with people, you know, nervous of this potential selling pressure. So, you know, a lot of people are speculating that this is the reason why the crypto market pulled back here. Yeah, 100 percent. And that's a great point of, you know, you wake up on a Monday um, or Tuesday and there's tons of selling pressure. You look on Twitter and it only takes one of those bigger accounts to fire off, you know, U.S. government selling two billion worth of Bitcoin, and then it snowballs from there because then all the other bigger accounts are like, "Oh, breaking news! I got to fire it off." And I, I think that's really what happened because it was all from you know the seven a.m., six a.m. to nine a.m. It's all I saw on Twitter, and then on the back half of the day, you start to get the Alex Thorne replies and people kind of breaking it down in a different facet. So shout out to Alex Thorne; he was on the podcast from Galaxy Digital uh, a couple weeks ago. So if you haven't seen that one, uh, check that out a couple weeks back. But yeah, I think I think it's a good, um, you know, always always know that you know you can always get the most breaking news from Twitter quickly, but you need to kind of parse through it because sometimes the the mass headlines are not what they seem. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And that's why it's always good to like be following the right people on Twitter, right? You follow the wrong person, you're going to misunderstand this stuff. Like Tivo said, Alex Thorne is a brilliant mind. And if you haven't heard the podcast with them, highly recommend you go and you check it out. And 
if you're following the right people, you know, you tend to get fed <laughs> the better information. There's nothing worse than already waking up on a Monday. No one's usually in a good mood when they wake up on a Monday, waking up and see, hey, the government could be selling billions of dollars of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm sure that just sent people from a bad mood to a worse one and uh, kind of created a catalyst that could have been avoided. But I was sending into our group chats. I was like, guys, can we confirm this? What do you think about this? Hello? <laughs> nobody nobody was answering. <laughs> I was like, guys, check this out. Well, I think this raises a good question of like, is this whole thing a bull trap, right? You know, is this just the dip before the rip? We like to have a saying over here called a slip, dip, and a rip. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the main question that most people are asking is saying, is this the dip before the rip? And ultimately, I think in the bigger picture, it is. Um, and there's still a couple ecosystems that are standing out aside from the macros. I think if we look at real world assets and tokenization, um, the base layer two and Solana, especially those three ecosystems, and we kind of referenced them last week, but I want to give them credit again. They still look strong. They're still performing well. They're holding value uh, relatively well, even with things really starting to pull back with, you know, a 10% pullback in Bitcoin. It's typically a double digit pullback in alts uh, as well. But R the RWA and tokenization space and the Solana ecosystem have held value really, really well. And so those are two that I've been keeping my eye on. Again, base as well. I think base has been doing really good. The TVL on things like Solana and base are just skyrocketing. So is their activity. And another one that's been on my mind here, and I know we talk about it internally a lot, but I don't know how much we talk about it on the rundown, is uh, also MakerDAO. And I was looking at this awesome chart. In fact, let me see if I can pull it up because this is such an interesting chart. I think everyone deserves to kind of see this, this representation. And uh, let's go ahead and flash it up on the screen here. So this is showing the profitability or the revenue rather of Maker and Solana. So you can see Maker in the pink, Solana in the um, green, and we can just see that their revenue has skyrocketed. Both Maker and Solana are now seeing all-time highs in revenue, or multi-year highs at least in terms of revenue, um, compared to their previous stuff. And you can see that really since January of last year, revenue has completely turned around and gone absolutely parabolic from around on Maker, it was around you know uh, five million dollars, I think, a month, and then now we look at it, and they're doing ten x that at over fifty million dollars a month, and it just continues to grow. And the revenue chart on top here has just gone completely parabolic for both Solana and for Maker. And then we go and we look at their market caps, their fully diluted market caps, not at all time highs yet, but. Again, a complete turnaround kind of showing that their revenue and their market caps are, are working in comparison here. And so when I'm looking at this kind of stuff, at least to me, it makes sense that cryptos that have all-time highs in revenue, like if they broke their all-time high of, of revenue, it should mean, in my opinion, that their market cap would also break all-time high. Um, right, because think about it this way: you know, you look at a stock company and they're valued at a billion dollars when they're doing, you know, again, we're just going to make up numbers, but they're valued at a billion dollars when they're making a billion dollars in revenue. Well, what happens when those companies are doing two billion dollars in revenue and they're still being valued at seven hundred and fifty um, million dollars? Right, it doesn't make any sense that they should have a lower valuation for having higher revenue models. So they are at all time highs of revenue but they're at a lower valuation than they were previously. And so for most people, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so that's why I'm looking at things like this. And there's more examples out here, right? We're not just shilling Solana and MakerDAO. Uh, there's a lot of other great projects that are also in the same boat, but I think it's something to, to kind of look into because some people at face value would say, well, Solana's only at um, all-time high in, in revenue because of the memes, and it's only because of memes. And it's like, okay, well... This goes so much deeper than just meme culture right now because Maker doesn't deal at all in memes. Yet MakerDAO is still here seeing all-time high um, revenue um, despite not having anything thing to do with memes. And so what this tells me is that from a bigger perspective, from like a cultural standpoint, um, the crypto market 
is holistically more profitable than ever. It's moving upwards together. And although there are these, these genres that are standing out, the whole space is looking good. And so whether it's something like MakerDAO or Solana, who are you know, very different from a, from a project standpoint, from a fundamental standpoint, right? They're both being wildly successful. And again, there's plenty of other examples that are different from both Solana and Maker over here that are seeing similar stuff. So some stats that I've been looking at, you know, if you're wondering kind of where your project stands, I challenge everyone, you know, on the chart up here, we are using token terminal, but I challenge everyone that if you're curious, like where your project stands and, and which projects should be worth paying attention to, look at their revenue, you know, look at their activity, look at some of these on-chain metrics um, that correlate to these projects. Um, because just like we would look at the stock market and say, hey, this company is, you know, one of the most profitable companies in the world, they're probably likely to continue appreciating so long as they continue increasing their revenue, right? We look at a stock market like that, and I kind of have the same approach to crypto saying, hey, if we go and we look at some of the most bullish, most you know, revenue-heavy projects that are out there, the odds are those projects are going to be okay. Um, and they're going to produce a, a return if they continue to pull in record levels of revenue. So something that I've paid attention to, and I think it's worth for everyone out there to to look into this kind of stuff. And not every project has a revenue uh, stream yet, right? Some projects are working towards that. They're not there yet. But for the ones that do have it available, I think it's a worthwhile metric to kind of to to pay attention to. Yeah, and I actually got a, que I got a question for you. So yeah. when it comes to comparing those two like you just did, I think you can't discount um, the efforts of being out in the space in a marketing sense. So I know both projects very well, obviously, especially MakerDAO from our team is, is you know, really likes it. But uh, where it comes to Solana is like, I see them all over Twitter all the time. Yeah. Um, their people are always reaching out to different, and you know, doing interviews, doing the, the conferences. Um, you know, we've had, we always talk about Austin Federer. He's a, you know, three, four time, uh, you know, guest on the podcast in the last year and a half. Whereas like, not that's not. I'm not saying that makes Solana better than MakerDAO by any means, but it gets it more in the public eye. And pair that with meme coin mania, it's like that's why you're gonna see probably a lot more, you know, average retail money flow to a Solana because of the marketing efforts and just making sure that people know what Solana is. It is in the public eye, and I I also understand that you know it's maybe been in the public eye longer with the SBF saga, but like you could say that that was also a negative. So I didn't know what your thoughts were around kind of the you know, I don't want to call it marketing of like in marketing, like true marketing by our product, but just kind of getting the name out there. Yeah. You know, everyone has a different approach, right? And I think you have to cater to your audience. And recently Solana has done a, a good job of doing that. They know where their audience is. Uh, they know what's hot right now with meme coins and the best way to kind of promote their current, like promoting their current circumstance is through social media. Um, I think Maker is a little bit different, right? They look at tokenizing different things and they work in the world of finance and they're a little bit more like collared, if that makes sense. They they cater to, I think, a more mature audience because of the nature of their project. And so for them, they definitely have a social media presence, but it's not nearly the same approach as Solana. And so that's kind of the way that I look at it. Um, when you look at Maker, for example, they're always going and forming these crazy partnerships. And they talk about how they are supported and backed by like all these different like bonds and treasuries and all this stuff. Um, and Solana is a little bit of a different approach. So I think for the aspiring projects out there, you have to understand who your target market is. For some people, it is the like blue collar workers that are a little bit more formal. And for other people, it's a little bit more the DGENs. And so you're probably going to have your best luck going on on social media, you know, whether that's Twitter or TikTok or whatever it is, and uh, kind of catering to your audience there. I don't know. We got to try and get somebody from Maker on. I feel like I haven't. I've seen. I've definitely seen them more on Twitter recently, and some people that were are in our network are interacting with them. But um, yeah, it would be cool to see if we could try and uh, try and find somebody from there. Hundred percent. And I think we rabbit <laughs> we rabbit trailed a little bit from the initial question of like, is this whole thing a bull trap. Um, and in short, I think the answer is yes. We never really fully answered this, but I think the answer 
here is yes. And maybe we see more downside. You know, I was talking with Bryce and Matt yesterday, two of the other analysts. I know most people here are familiar with Bryce, but we do have another analyst um, named Matt Polvey. And we were all kind of just chatting yesterday saying, hey, where do we think that this market can go from here? Um, especially with the breakdown. And I still think it comes back to the idea of if Bitcoin breaks its current lows, breaks the 50 day moving average and forms a lower low, then I think it's possible that Bitcoin goes back down into the 50 thousands and sees a little bit of a heavier retrace, maybe to like the mid low 50s at the very most. And it comes all the way back down there. Now, I think that's a worst case scenario. I think the better case scenario here is that we hold the 50, we hold the zone, you know, maybe we chop around for a bit because whenever we look at the having, it always comes with some sort of chop or bearish price action. So going into this having, I don't expect it to be any different. I mean, heck, we're seeing chop now. We, we've seen it for the past month of Bitcoin just chopping around sideways um, and liquidating a lot of people. And so I kind of expect that continue to go into the having. But I think that after the having, we are going to see some really positive price action. We saw it in the first halving cycle. We saw it in the second halving cycle. We saw it in the third halving cycle of 2021. And I think we're going to see it again. I don't think it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows. I think the current circumstances that we have are a great example of that. But I think that when it's all said and done and we look after the halving, that's typically when we have the the run that everyone looks forward to. And so the way that I look at this, holistically speaking, is saying, hey, until that point, for me, it's still a very much just a buy the dip opportunity. I see this as an opportunistic area to accumulate on the things that are really going to be successful or have the best chances of success going into that parabolic market cycle. Because one of the things that I've said on here before is I, I really do believe that everything up until this point has been off the catalyst of the ETFs, and we haven't even really stepped into the pool of the Bitcoin having catalyst yet, because that's usually a catalyst that begins after the having itself has actually happened, and the having hasn't happened yet. It's a couple of weeks away, and so I think we've been riding the tailwinds of the ETF catalyst, and we're chopping around a little bit around the time of the having, and then you know maybe a month from now or something. You know, maybe it could be tomorrow, right? We don't have a crystal ball, but I think at some point after the having itself, we are going to transfer from the ETF catalyst to having both the ETF catalyst still being there, but also having the the having catalyst as well. And so, one of the things that we had a really great conversation with, and I'm sure the pod, if it's not already out, it'll be out really soon. But we just had a killer pod with Matt Hogan from Bitwise, and. One of the things that he said that stuck with me is that he we've already seen around, I think, 12 to $14 billion um, in the Bitcoin ETFs. And he says that he's expecting another $50 billion. So he's expecting the amount that has flowed through these Bitcoin ETFs to 5x from what we have currently seen already in the first quarter. And then he said he expects that next year it's going to be even larger than what we've seen this year. And if that's true, then not only could the remainder of this year be really positive, but also next year could potentially be even better. Um, and yeah, so that's my thought process on this whole matter. It was like, is this a bull trap? I think so. I think that, you know, I'm not saying that the bottom's in. I'm not saying that we can't chop around. But as we said weeks ago, you know, the best times to buy and we showed the historical chart is when this thing dips. And my narrative on that has not changed. I think that when we dip at a time like this, this is going to be the time that we look back in a month, two, three months from now and say, man, I can't believe I got stopped out by all the fear and all the FUD. I wish I would have just bought Bitcoin when it was at the low 60,000s. And there's going to be a lot of people who did that or do that um, just like they look back at the previous cycle and say, man, I wish that I bought Bitcoin at um, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, now that it's at 60. And I think they're going to be doing the same thing when Bitcoin goes from 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 and uh, so on. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up Matt. Um, so that actually, for all the listeners, that's going to be out in two weeks, two weeks time, because we just recorded that uh, yesterday or mon Monday, two days ago. But uh, I think that along with Matt, you, you just have to think, again, go back to last cycle and where we are today. And you have to remember, you have people like Matt Hogan on your side. You got Larry Fink. 
You got Fidelity. You got Kathy Wood. You have all these long-term bulls that, you know, th- these people understand. It's not a one-month game, a six-month game, a year game. These, th- th- these products have been built for the future. And so, you know, in a time frame of a week, two weeks, you know, to a month, it's these these dips, you know, buying opportunities, like you said, is, is that you got to remember who's on your side now and who's looking forward with you. Um, so if you had the conviction last year, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, you know, it would be kind of silly to not have the conviction today, in my opinion. Agreed with you. So in essence here, I blame SBF for the dip, TVO. I think it's all Sam Bankman Freed's fault. It's all, <laughs> it's all FTX's fault, but no, you know, all, all jokes aside, we actually have some breaking news around this case. Yeah. So you got the meme on the screen. I don't know how you created that, but that is just perfect. It almost looks like, no, realistic. that's, I can't, I can't take credit. I can't take credit for this. I can't oh, take okay, credit okay. for this one. This one says grand old memes, but who knows who actually created this? That's the beauty of the meme world is sometimes you never know who actually creates them. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no. So he, he was sentenced. I thought the most interesting thing about his sentencing was that it didn't it it caught it caught the eye of Twitter for like half a day. Honestly, yeah. I'll even give him a full day, maybe. And uh, obviously, it was on TV a little bit, especially on the finance networks. But nobody, um, I don't want to say nobody cares anymore. But it's it's definitely people are more focused on the future than the past when it comes to this guy, which is good. But he was sentenced to uh, yeah, hundred percent, and he was sentenced to twenty five years. And there's speculation he might be able to get out uh, with with some good behavior, but I, my favorite my favorite thing was the quote that that he gave on on his way to uh, on his way <laughs> on his way after the sentencing is this is a quote from him he goes I did not think what I was doing was illegal I like to think I hold myself to a high standard and I certainly did not meet it so SBF still thinking that he didn't do anything illegal we're talking about like the greatest case of financial fraud in history. And his quote is, I didn't think I was doing anything illegal. I was, it should be like continued on. I didn't think I was doing anything illegal. I was just committing the most large scale financial fraud in US history and in the world's history from my understanding. But, oh man, like you said, he's locked up. It looks like he'll be away for 25 years, maybe a little bit less on, on good behavior, but wild story. What the whole thing's wild, but it is good to see that most people have moved on from this. I was reading about it. Uh, they've recovered, I think, about 90% of the funds. And so they're looking at getting those funds back to the investors and to all the people who lost money. So most people are saying, okay, you know, I'm going to get the majority of the money that I lost at the time of me losing it back. And they're okay with that. And so a lot of people are starting to look forward to a brighter future instead of being like salty and negative about what happened in the past. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I'm sure the, the uh, bankruptcy lawyers are getting a nice little five, 10% of that couple billion oh, yeah. as well. So they're, they're having a good, they're having a good time. Oh yeah. They're having probably a field day, but you know, yeah. as we continue on here, you know, we're staying optimistic. We're watching everything that's happening. There's certainly hot sectors out there. And, you know, the one thing that I want to leave everyone with here is we always use the saying, the trend is your friend when we're looking at like a price chart or something like that. But it really goes so much deeper than that. Um, I think that the idea of the trend being your friend is also equally as applicable when we're looking at what's hot in the markets, right? We've seen certain genres, you know, gaming, for example, I'm a huge fan of the gaming space. I have been for years looking at it in its current state. It's been out. It's been getting outperformed by some of the other sectors. I would say the bulk of crypto here has kind of seen a little bit of a downturn, but there are sectors that are standing out. You know, things like Solana and Base and, and RWAs, like we mentioned. And so, playing to the trend is something that I've been doing here because you're you're not betting on the things that are struggling. You're betting on the things that are hot. And so, when you're looking at like potentially using the idea of the trend is your friend, it's not only on like the charts, right? It's also on the topics. So if a whole genre, if a whole industry is like hot and moving up in prices right now and it's doing well, well, the odds of you being successful in that industry versus like the gaming one or something else, you know, maybe it's like interoperability or something, uh, or, or even like the privacy space or the money transfer space or whatever it is, you know, areas that are doing less successful than some of the hot ones. Those are the ones that I'm looking at because they have the best odds 
of of moving upwards and appreciating in value. Even if I choose the wrong one, the whole space is doing really well and it's outperforming most of the other crypto industries. And so that's what I've been doing here, TiVo. I've been kind of looking at what's hot and looking at those verticals and playing to them um, because that's what people are the most interested in right now. So as we move forward, still very optimistic on the long-term future of crypto. Maybe we get some more chop. You know, I'm hoping that by the next time that we come back over here, we're back above the 20-day moving average. We're back up. You know, but I think that we could have some volatility. Bitcoin's pretty range bound now between the mid 60s and the low 70s. And so it's looking like the next time we come back, you know, we'll probably still be in this range. But man, I really hope that we don't crack that low. Um, and I really hope that we don't crack the 50 because if that happens, there could definitely be some volatility to the downside, just in the same way that, it, I mean, if we crack to the upside and we see new highs above 75, we will have liquidated, I think four or five billion in shorts, something like that. And man, if we do that, then Bitcoin can go on an equal tear to the upside. So it's a time of excitement. There's a lot of stuff on the horizon. We had a lot of big news to also look forward to. And the halving is right around the corner. So if you all want to stay tuned and stay in touch with everything that's happening in the great world of crypto, you know, we humbly believe that this is going to be your best place to do it. So we're going to be back at the same time, same place next week, everyone. But thank you all for tuning in and we'll talk to you soon.